Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to, to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And a good morning to you all. Today is 7th of October 2015, and Wednesday you are here with Grace. Um, where, um, firstly, let's just discuss and also comment on the, uh, something happened about this event in the Philippines. Apparently, there are two men who are arrested in the Philippines over the unrelated crimes are being investigated. Um, there is a possible involvement in the kidnapping of these two Canadians uh, and also uh, Nor- Norwegian and also Filipina as well. So um, these two men arrested in the Philippines, uh, one of men uh, was detained on unrelated charges of kidnapping and murder, while the other was carrying a gun and a grenade as well. And uh, according to this uh, uh, superintendent Antonio Rivera, the police spokesman for the Davao region in, on the South uh, Island, uh, Southern Ireland and Mindanao. So they arrested together in Davao City, which was just on Sunday. And then these two are now being questioned over the September 21st abduction of this, uh, the three Westerners and also one of uh, the Filipina uh, from uh, the island resort of Samai nearby the Davao. So they are currently looking looking at the, the television footages as well. And the, this Canadian res, uh, tourist, John uh, Reed Still, who was 68, and uh, Robert Hall, who was 50, as well as the Hall's girlfriend, Maritas Flo, and the Nor- Norwegian uh, resort manager, uh, Katan uh, Seki Stad, who was 56, they were b- seen uh, being dragged away by this government in a boat in a chilling a uh, footage earlier released by the police so of course it is very feared the whole hostages have been taken to the heavily forested south island of jolo and also stronghold of islamic militants more than 500 kilometers from samal so jolo is the main base of the abu Shaaf and al-qaeda leaked group blame for the country's deadliest terror attacks beheadings and also as well as kidnapping of these foreign tourists and christian missionaries so nowadays when we go for a uh, tour or even trips uh, around the southeast asia now we really need to look out as well as be careful with our belongings and as well as whether the routes that we are taking into so make sure that all the tourists out there please be careful and then yes southeast east asia is still beautiful co- uh, country beautiful continent but still please be aware of where you are and then please keep yourself updated with all those news going around we'll take a short break and when we come back we'll deliver news on the uh, political side of southeast asia so stay tuned asean dailies First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Good morning. You are with Grace. So, on our political news for today, rampant use of sedition act made worse by blatant selective double standards. Lawyers for Liberty, uh, Executive Director Eric Paulson from Malaysia, saying that it is extremely disappointed with the federal court's verdict on Azmi Sharum's case. Uh, this is related to the previous case where he, Azmi Sharum, was convicted of the Sedition Act. 
So uh, when you talk about the most modern states in the world, he also argued that they had either repealed or put such oppressive re uh, legislation into this disuse. So this rampant and uh, discri indiscriminate uh, use of sedition act is uh, it's a very ill-defined seditious tendency of fans function as catch all the provisions to target all and also uh, for anything that is remotely contentious mm -hmm. and thus stifling democratic norms and creating climate of fear. Well, according to him, yes, of course, the Sedition ha Act has been creating a lot of uh, fear among the public as well as a lot of uh, arguments among the public as well. Mm -hmm. And he also claimed the situation was worsened by the, this uh, selective and double standard use of the Sedition Act, which was cracking down the herd against uh, this uh, di a dissident of the opposition uh, as well as opposition politician for anything remote, remotely controversial as well. That's true. And that's a huge problem because, I mean, Malaysia is supposed to be a democratic nation. Uh, and early on, the government has uh, repelled the Internal Security Act, uh, the ISA, which was used uh, widely during uh, Tun Mahathir's time. Uh, but now it seems like because there is no ISA, now the government is using the Sedition Act and making it constitutionally to use it against people who just want to voice out, voice out their concern about issues. And according to uh, Azmi Sharum, he was first charged in September mm -hmm. last year under Section 41B and Section 41C of the Act for allegedly making seditious comments about the Perak Constitution crisis in an online article called The Take Perak Crisis Route for Speedy End to Selangor Impasse. Uh, but the problem is... He was making an academic remark. It wasn't. It wasn't a remark uh, trying to make a biased judgment about what happened during the Perak fiasco. Right. Well, with all these incidents that have happened in Malaysia, we ha we can actually question where is the democracy practice, the proper uh, 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 practice of democracy, and then will this sedition act be ever be fair uh, on the public as well as those for those who do voice out their opinions mm -hmm. on uh, publicly and also be able to you know communicate with the government and public or even even among the public itself. So these are the areas that we need to think widely for as Malaysians uh, because at the end of the day, uh, Sedition Act will affect all Malaysians. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, let's move on to the Philippines, a late Philippine detector's son to run for vice president. As you all know, uh, Philippines used to have a dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, and guess what? He has a son, and his son will be running for vice president in the next year's election in a new gauge of their family's political clout nearly three decades after they were ousted in a people's power revolt. Well, this is pretty interesting. Uh, when someone wants to rule uh, or even uh, to be uh, in a higher position, well, the background is also very important. And then he's also uh, a son of somebody who did uh, run or uh, actually uh, controlled the country before. So um, Marcos Jr. asked the Filipinos in the statement to judge him based on his 26-year career in the government as a provincial uh, official and also national lawmaker. Uh, and also when you talk about uh, his age, he's already 58 and he did not touch on the allegations of massive corruption and also widespread rights violation against his father in the country which still marks the sort of the anniversary of each year of uh, Marcos's uh, 1986 ouster as a triumph of democracy. So he, according to him, he also says, well, he has decided to put my political fortune in the hands of the Filipino people. But when you talk about the oldest, um well, political statement and also opinions. Yes, a lot of uh, people, especially politicians, they like to say, yes, my political fortune mm. is in the hand of the people and we do listen of the public voices and all. But then after all, the, when they're actually in the position, uh, 
um, they they tend to function otherwise. So here we have the expectation for him, but we'll see how it goes like from there. Well, on as well. the thing it. The thing is, he's the son of a corrupt leader who has never been charged. We have to remember that they just back off uh, from the limelight uh, because uh, their existence itself was uh, the sign that democracy was completely abolished okay. at the time. But the thing is uh, that I found it to be very uh, concerned is he might just be a puppet for his father to continue their dictatorial legacy. And secondly, we do not know much about him uh, as a person, Marcos Jr. Correct. Uh, so I- at the end of the day, I think uh, what we want, I mean, what the Filipinos want is to continue the democratic uh, system that they fought so hard during the 1986 um, with the People's Power Revolt. So I'm, I'm pretty interested in this year's, or next year's, is it, is it 2016 or 2017? 2017. 16, I think. 16. Uh, the upcoming Philippines uh, election, I'm really interested to see because there will be a lot of really interesting personalities. And in fact, uh, talking about personalities, boxing superstar Manny Pacquiao will run for the Senate for next year. Well, this is not an interesting uh, news just to to add on to this news. Well, uh, all... We all know uh, Manny uh, Pacquiao is the boxer. Mm. And then uh, uh, recently we had the century of the boxing uh, championship. And we also had a lot of stories from there. And in fact, this very famous uh, boxer, he also he's also willing to do something for the country, it looks like. So we'll see how it goes. Like We'll update you. I'm, I'm just dumbfounded. Everyone wants to run for... for- for president. You remember the infamous <laughs> speech by Kenya West <laughs> in MTV saying that he will run for president the, for the next uh, the next one? I to me it's like <laughs> just continue to make music. <laughs> That's where you're good at. Anyway, uh continuing our discussion, government launches investment program monitoring labor intensive. Uh, this is in Indonesia. President Jokowi launched an investment program that will monitor 16 companies in the labor intensive industry. This is actually an effort to increase employment and boost optimism amid sluggish domestic economic growth. Well, he highlighted that the importance of this optimism despite the domestic economic slowdown and he wanted to encourage all the 16 companies to remain a bit as there are still opportunities in the country and which we can turn into investment and also employment. Well, Indonesia is now at a sort of a hot spot at the moment because of haze. But then now when you talk about all this economical side, he is also looking at the brighter side to encourage people and especially the companies that he mentioned to be able to boost up uh, in terms of their uh, productivity and also efficiency. So he will monitor this 16 country and then um, uh, uh, according to he said because of because of with this optimism uh, we'll be able to settle the economic problems that are happening in the country also so those 16 companies have realized about 789 million US dollars in the investment uh, that's also as of September and of of the total 18.9 trillion rupiah investment. Oh, that's great. Yes, estimated for this project. So 11 of these firms are foreign investors from South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and Singapore. So with all these development countries uh, that Indonesia will be handling, hope that the companies will be able to boost up their pro- productivity. Mm. And also to uh, create more employments for more than 100,000 workers. And, and what is interesting is Djokovic is also urging uh, business people to consult the agency called Investment Coordinating Board or BKPM should there be any problem in terms of investment as, as well as layoff issues. Labor intensive industry covers uh, firm in a lot of different areas. So these are the areas that Jokowi really want to push uh, as hard as he's, he's, he can because economically Indonesia is doing not, not nothing, not better than Malaysia. So that's how things goes right now. We have to go ahead. And uh, moving on to another news in Australia, mm-hmm. 
he, they are looking for new countries for refugees. Well, uh, this is uh, quite a uh, bright news, <laughs> we can say. I would say it, it <laughs> is uh, not a good news. I mean, Australia is supposed to absorb refugees. They, are, they signed the UN declaration to acknowledge uh, refugees and create shelters for them. And now they are just going to push aside the responsibility and give it to another country. Well, uh I guess on my on my side on, on my opinion they have their own reason why they are doing this uh perhaps they don't want to take a responsibility for taking all the refugees but uh, I think they are talking about the capabilities of whether they can take it or not and that this uh they are uh, uh seeking a new countries to resettle these refugees and after confirming only four people have moved to Cambodia and that they also agreed to accept refugees in a, in exchange for aid as well so there is a sort of hardline policy in the place for several years and the Canberra in Australia has denied asylum seekers arriving on unauthorized boats resettlement in Australia and uh, they are sending them instead to small Pacific nations like Nauru or Papua New Guinea and then those on the, uh, the they can actually resettle in those smaller countries and also those on the Nauru have the option of starting new uh, lives in Cambodia as well but only these four people who have uh, uh, agreed to do this uh, and also although the Cambodian officials have said the two more want to do so there will be people who will be flooding into certain countries but they Australia perhaps they are feared to uh, take this responsibility uh, responsibility for the longer term well there's one word for it it's called xenophobic <laughs> uh, Australians are they should take responsibility. I mean, in fact, the deal was condemned by rights groups and questioned by United Nations because Australia, I think the government themselves, they do not want to see that these refugees are human beings. They are not just a news, uh, people who want to create problems. But the problem with Australia is, I think what they are lacking is the kind of uh, far-sightedness that Germany had with the refugees in Syria. So they actually throw all these unwanted refugees, not just in detention camps in some remote islands. They also Now they are... Create, uh, they are creating deals with other countries mm -hmm. to just transfer them. And Cambodia, we all know, is a poor country. They, hum they have um, human rights violations and all that. So Australia is just washing hands. And, and I don't think this is something that is excusable for a country that uh, see itself as a first world country. Okay, well, um, still... Um, I don't know because in these situations, there are, it's not that they are throwing all those asylum seekers from their countries, but they still do provide another like places to stay. So they are opening another options for them, not just like you know just uh, sacking them away. So on my side, I can see still that it's a, a bit bright news mm -hmm. to to asylum seekers at least. Uh, you don't, you don't, uh, you give another option for them to stay, not just uh, sacking them away. Like, don't come to my country. That's it about it. But they still provide. Okay, why don't you go to Papua New Guinea or even Nauru? Or at least we can afford you to send transfer you there and then settle down, resettle your place But that's the thing, right? They there. are not gi be given choices because their first choice is Australia. They they do not want to settle to another third world country that have little to no basic faci facilities. So I think. I think in this case, even Amnesty International say that the decision itself is actually not good and it is definitely not um, making Australia's image as a first world country any better. Anyway, we will take a short break. When we return, we'll discuss on the economic side of Southeast Asia. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene again. Hi, welcome back. This is Grace. And of course, we are at our economic side of the news. So Grace, Myanmar is business leaders are actually fearing 
the election because it will slow down key reforms, apparently. I guess they are really uh, sort of um, expecting to have a sort of huge huge uh, transition uh, in Myanmar country that they are looking for. I mean, businessmen, they are looking for opportunities. And that, in fact, when Myanmar's ministers are trying to reassure the foreign business uh, that politically uh, uncertain during this election period, of course, all these business leaders will be a bit... Uh, uh, afraid of this election that uh, they will affect their sectors of course and the many key ministers have stepped down from their post to pro- uh, contest the country's November 8th election which is coming very soon and which will be the most competitive vote in the country has ever been mm-hmm. in decades and it will define the depth of reforms in the country ruled by military until the nominally civilian government took over in 2011. Uh, according to uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, in an interview during a campaign visit to his constituents, constituency, he said that he knows businessmen are worried about the gaps in the ministries after all of them stepped down to join the party. Despite such assurance, uh, um, from the minister Mian Tian and others, businesses have complained that they have having a hard time getting approval for their projects since control of the reform process has been concentrated in the hands of a few key ministers. So all the power in terms of decision making, who should get what uh, projects or what projects should be approved first is only between you know a couple of ministers and this is i mean to me it is worrying well i guess they have to take all those risks and also this is something that they should uh predict in terms of economic growth and also having investing uh, their their business in the country because myanmar is facing a major transition in mm-hmm. the country from militants and or, or militant to democracy and of course there will be lots of uh, arguments and all sort of conflict like the bit uh, among the country itself but of course the foreign business are very worried that ministers who are being challenged in their constituency by Aung San Suu Kyi over uh, the overwhelming popular national league for democracy and then uh, all this uh, the policies that will be uh, done in very any time soon uh, they are also afraid of uh, being affected by all these policies such as being able to register their companies in the country whether will it be long procedure or will it be easier for them N- uh, nothing is certain at this moment mm-hmm. so there you go and moving on to uh, Thailand which is also worrying about its own economy is turning to Mekong neighbors in Myanmar to diversify its exports Thai policymakers are searching for ways to reverse a slump in exports may have found a solution in Myanmar, a 170 billion market, uh, US dollar market, just over the border that's growing by more than 6% a year. Well, uh, there are shipments to China, Europe, and also U.S., but the, all of these are very slow. Mm-hmm. And the Thailand's government is crafting a strategy to deepen these links with Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, and the economic bloc known as the CLMV. And these countries, uh, the population is not that a lot, but it's around 240 million people. They can actually make also pretty a uh, contribute to the economic uh, uh, sort of contribution to the world. However, these countries don't uh, the economic uh, status are very very slow, mm-hmm. and Thailand is spending about 83 billion dollars over the next seven years to build the new uh, railways, and we are talking about the infrastructure here, roads and the custom checkpoints to remove these bottlenecks that that hampered trade with the neighbors. They're looking at certain like uh, possibilities that they, they can develop, but then they also need to look at their strategy mm-hmm. and also the uh, other areas they can really, really develop the, with the budget they're having at the moment. Yeah, so that's a great strategy, focusing on the CLMV countries, especially Myanmar. In fact, uh, Thailand is also negotiating a free trade agreement, this is on the side, uh, with Pakistan, and hopefully benefiting from India's 
border trade with Myanmar. India is also, while on the other hand, India is seeking deeper economic partnership with ASEAN member states as part of the President Narendra Modi's Act East policy. Talking about trade deals, uh, we all know that the TPP has just been signed and agreed upon, but not ratified in uh, or not being signed individually by the countries. Um, it's definitely a wake-up call, not just to Malaysians. I know a lot of Malaysians are in a shock right now, but also to Cambodia. The Commerce Ministry is looking closely into the ramifications of the TPP or Trans-Pacific Partnership signed by 12 nations on Monday, especially on how it may affect exports as Cambodia is not included in what is being billed as the world's well, I wouldn't say largest, I would say second largest free trade market because the largest would be the RCEP. Well, uh, the minister also said the government is currently uh, negotiating uh, this uh, uh, RCEP to diversify its export market beyond their reliance on the US as well as the European uh, Union as well. And they are negotiating with the China, Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand as well. And um, this TPP has brought a lot of worrisome uh, to many countries uh, recently, and especially in terms of the labor and also jobs, employment, and so on. And then they have already established these common standards for 12 countries. And of course, these 12 countries not only include ASEAN countries, but other countries such as Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, and even, uh, of course, the United States as well. And the Cambodia is looking into whether or not that they can join the TPP after all. Well, Malaysia is joining. I don't know. Maybe they should just jump the bandwagon like Malaysia, Singapore, and Thai. Uh, sorry, and Vietnam. But uh, it depends. It will definitely affect export and import mark uh, flows. But on the other hand, I think uh, the future of uh, trading it will be vastly different from. Uh, the current times in the future globalization will be a reality and and all these trade blocks will be part of the ways where countries can access mm. or not countries but more towards uh, companies or global companies can access to markets and also products uh, on the other hand we will take one short break we will continue with arts and cultures later on after this sure. music ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Eileen. Hi, this is Grace. And you're back with us again on our ASEAN Daily Arts and Culture Landmark Victory for Orang Asli in Malaysia after customary land dispute wind. So, for more than five years of field with a private company and land authorities over the Tanah Adat uh, or customary land, uh, the High Court's landmark decision last uh, yesterday, I think, uh, was a vital victory for the communities. Well, uh, the court ruled parts of the, this uh, frosted land alienated the, the, uh, to uh, Bionest Corp. Uh, this is a company. Be returned to the 570 Bionest Bionest <laughs> Corp. Uh, the company be returned to the 575 members of the Samai tribe, and they are also known as Sangoi. And uh, all this Kampung Orang Asli uh, Kuala Santa Village Chef uh, Bakanabana, who's 50 years old, uh, said the villages hunted, farmed, and gathered forest produce on the customary land. So, uh, what, uh, sorry, Bahwai, or also, also his name is called Kong Chi Wai, was relieved that the land, which has been the source of the village's livelihood, has been declared theirs. He said that they plant rubbers and oil palms on the land, and it is the only source of income for them, but it's already been taken away, and they have nothing to feed the family. In fact, many of the sacred spots here are located on the land. It is comforting to know that the private sectors are not the one occupying them. Instead, it will be uh, uh, they will be able to teach their children and gran grandchildren about these spots. Let's move on to Singapore when it comes to the smartest kids in the world. Singapore tops the chart. 
Well, congratulations to Singapore. Uh, and I mean, well, it's the world's class teacher. Pa- <laughs> they have the the oldest straight A students, and Singapore has the a very good universities there as well. And their uh, academic success has helped it become uh, uh, th- uh to drive the economy as well. And the way it has built its education system could hold lessons for the rest of the world. And this uh Singapore, the nation is very fast. Fascinating, according to Mark Tucker, who is the president of the U.S. National Center on Education and Economy. Yeah. He said it was a major British port before the Second World War, and when Britain got out of the got out of it and closed its base in Singapore, was a terrible shape. But now, today, Singapore has come up with the, one of the best performing economies around the world, and of course, they did a very good job on that. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, they, there's been clear to them that the world's economy no longer rewards people just for what they know mm-hmm. that's the thing Google knows everything the world economy rewards people of what they can do with what they know and that's a problem because uh, kids in Singapore are conditioned to be good at what they studied but in the real world uh, you don't you are not you, you are not just to be you are not I mean being good at what you studied or what you have learned before is not enough you need to apply it to make uh, the world a better place or to make your job more efficient and that's the part that I think Singapore is still lacking because a part of it is mm-hmm. about creativity and creativity cannot be taught in school just like that mm-hmm. but then uh, what we can respect from the Singapore is the oldest educators uh, they're all well educated in a certain areas so they know what they are educating all the students so basically the importance of education is instilled even when kids are at a young age so they know the the significance and also how the first years of child love is very important especially for parents mm-hmm. so uh, in Singapore that's the, the the beauty of education I will say they, they know how they can educate their children according to what it is uh, crafted in the society. Uh, of course, um, the practical, the real world, and also all the, the education system may be different and may also be varied. However, uh, they have the resources and they have the system there already that the people can follow and also form at least to have the very strong basic foundation. That's true. But one thing for sure, I remember when Steve Wozniak from Apple, or he used to uh, be one of the co-founders for Apple, uh, went to Singapore, he said that you cannot... uh, He cannot imagine another Apple being born in Singapore because the environment just doesn't allow it. So I think that's another thing that Singapore government can address to create more creative spaces for young people to flourish, not just intellectual space. Mm -hmm. So that's all from us today. Thanks for listening. And of course, you can always listen to us via your mobile by downloading our app Duran ASEAN on our app store. And we also do have our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So uh, do leave us the comments, and the comments are welcome.